Welcome to our second presentation on stocks. Exciting stocks, sexy stocks, risky stocks. Now, have you studied the first presentation enough so that you have a pretty good understanding of how to explain what stocks are to somebody who has no idea what kind of return we could get from stocks over time? What are the advantages and disadvantages of stocks? We need you to be awesome, dear students. So study, study, study. In this presentation, we're going to take a look at stock markets. Specifically, where are stocks bought and sold? And we're going to see that the world is changing oh so rapidly. So let's get started on slide number 11, discussing the primary versus the secondary markets. The primary market is the market in which new issues of securities are sold to the public. We call it an initial public offering, an IPO. It's the first public sale of a company stock. You might have heard them say this company is going public or taking the company public. Most retail investors do not participate in the primary market. And my humble recommendation is that we really shouldn't. We're outgunned, so to speak. Typically, it turns out people who have a lot of money are usually way ahead of us and are and we're at the back of the line, typically. But that doesn't mean you might not decide you want to get involved. The secondary market is the place that most of all of us are going to work, are going to uh, participate in. That's the market in which the securities, in this case stocks, are traded after they've been issued to the public. And the vast majority of transactions take place in the secondary market. In other words, investors selling shares to one another. That's what people refer to when they refer to the stock market. The primary market, though, is very important because this is how companies become public. Why? Why should a company go public? Well, there are many reasons to raise money to start a new business or expand a business to pay for ongoing business expenses. Many of the biotech companies here in San Diego are continually having secondary offerings. They're already public companies, but they're not making any money and they're spending tens, hundreds of millions of dollars getting that drug to market. They need more cash. So they sell more pieces of themselves. Once a company is large enough, it's a way to gain prestige and respect within the investment and industrial communities. It's just it considered something you do. There are very few uh, private companies that are very large. Why? Because, as we said, they want to gain prestige and respect. And also, there's a tremendous reward for those who started the business. Yes, they become instant millionaires, multimillionaires, now billionaires on in one day. <laughs> and... So, now, so that sounds it's exciting, doesn't it? You, you want to do that too, huh? right? Okay, well, remember, it's a very, very competitive environment that you are uh, 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 getting involved with when you eat, sleep, and breathe seven years of your life to bring a company public, and then somebody beats you to it or something else happens that totally makes your technology or for you. Yeah, for everyone, Google, there were lots of Lycoses and AltaVista and Go and as Jeeves and, and Dogpile. And you don't believe me, but those are real companies, folks. Also, once a company becomes sufficiently large, it just becomes very difficult for the owners to divvy up the spoils without going public. Think about it. If you were one of the people who started GE or Coca-Cola or Walmart decades ago, how would you sell your share of the business? Not easy to do. And plus, when a company becomes public, when it's sufficiently large, it becomes public, it's usually easier to run. huh? Well, in closely held private companies, family dynamics can become very, very, 
very uh, problematic, so to speak. And if you are so inclined, take a look at some of the large publicly, I'm not sorry, private companies and see how they are managed. Uh, one such great example is uh, In-N-Out Burger. When the people, the, the couple that started it passed away, there was a, basically a fight for the soul of the company inside the family. This, these things happen. And uh, right now there's a bit of a kerfuffle over Goya, which is a um, Latin you know, Hispanic food company and another company called Publix, which is, it's not here, it's on the, it's in Florida and the East Coast, but it's a, it's a grocery store chain. And uh, these are you know, privately held companies. And so things can get very problematic. So if you're so inclined, uh, just type in privately held companies. One of the largest privately held companies that's been around for forever is Mars. Snickers, yeah, right, <laughs> M&Ms. Um, yeah, you can buy shares in Hershey. I think they've merged with somebody else, I forget. Or Mondelez, who are they? Oreos. Um, but you can't buy shares in Mars. Interesting. In Snickers and M&Ms. On slide 13, we learn that once a company be goes, once a company goes public, be, becomes a publicly traded company, they don't have to repay the money. It's not, it, this is not a, a loan. This, they are selling a piece of themselves. They are no, under no obligation to repurchase the shares. And the shareholder who bought the shares may or may not be able to find someone who will purchase the shares from them. But of course, it's, it's a bona fide, which is a fancy way of saying a real company making real products and making real money, then yes, somebody's going to want to buy your shares. But now, once the company has gone public, it is a public entity. Yeah, we still, it's, it's a private company, yes, but, but it's not privately held, it's publicly held. So now they have many rights and responsibilities that private companies, privately held companies, we should say, do not need to worry about. Uh, if you went to to uh, uh, Hershey's or Mondelez or one of the other companies that is public that sells uh, sugar in, in many ways and shapes and forms and said, how much did you make last year? Well, they would say, OK, take a look at our 10K, our 10Q. Uh, here's our, our, our quarterly and our, our annual re report. Um, I'm sorry, 10K is the annual, 10Q is the pub is the quarterly report. Whereas if you went to Mars or Publix or In-N-Out Burger, they'd say, who are you? We don't have to tell <laughs> you. Yeah. Are you the IRS? No. We don't have to tell you how much money we, we made. We are privately held. Now, in your book, if you're following along in the book, the book goes into far too much detail, in my humble opinion, about initial public offerings. Folks, IPOs usually do not live up to their expectations. That doesn't mean there aren't good ones. I'm not trying to say otherwise. but uh, the average IPO loses 50% of its value within the first year. Yes, yes, it does. In fact, Mr. Benjamin Graham uh, said that IPO stood for imaginary profits only. Right, or it's probably overpriced. <laughs> or invest insider's pr uh, profit opportunity. He wasn't too keen on IPOs. And even IPOs that eventually become very, very uh, uh, successful, such as Facebook. Facebook quickly lost 50% of its value, almost. Uh, and then, of course, it's done very well since then. Others like Google, hmm, they started off at 85, and then within eight months, they were 200, and then they kept going from there. So there are you know, many success, success stories in IPOs, many more not so successful yes uh yes so so be careful and as i and i remember everybody has their own biases and i tell you mine up front i think the vast majority of us uh, retail investors just should stay away from these because if you do dig through the chapter five material in the book or if for example you do uh, become a want uh, want to become a stockbroker or register representative, whatever the term, you know, the legal term is register representative. You have to know the IPO process very, very well. And you will realize that it's stacked against 
the little guy and little gal. You have to really be connected to these large brokerage firms and have a lot of money and yeah, yeah, to get a really good price. Otherwise, you get the worst price available and makes the very rich people even richer. Uh, nothing's perfect. Okay, let's discuss the secondary markets because these are the places where the vast majority of us are going to be investing. These are the markets in which securities are sold after they've been issued, sometimes called the aftermarket. The secondary markets provide liquidity, which is a fancy way of saying I can easily buy and sell shares of bona fide real companies, and they provide a mechanism for pricing and valuing those securities, such that you had 100 shares of whatever, maybe IBM, and the bank says, well, how much are those worth? Well, you look it up. Well, that's how much you're selling for right now on the New York Stock Exchange. So when people talk about the stock market, they are almost always referring to the secondary market, which is why we don't say the secondary market. We just say stock market. There were, <laughs> we should say, were two types of secondary markets. And even though we still sometimes use uh, two different phrases for them, there is there's literally no distinction anymore technologically. They both operate the same way nowadays. We have the organized securities exchanges, which are centralized institutions in which transactions are made in outstanding securities, and they use what is called a double auction market. Well, let's just say they used to, because although... The New York Stock Exchange still has the, the floor, and they still show it to you on the nightly news. In very, very few transactions are actually happening on the floor. It's all happening electronically. And that was in juxtaposition, was, not anymore, to the over-the-counter markets, OTC markets, which were widely scattered telecommunication networks through which transactions are made in outstanding securities and smaller IPOs. This was a quote-based system. Well, folks, again, this is archaic. This is before the internet, before telecommunications, before uh, massively powerful computer systems. These OTC markets just were people with telephones scattered around the country, and they would call one another and, and buy and sell stuff over the phone, and they, you didn't want to deal with these people, folks. Your broker would deal with them. They took pride in how badly they treated one another. They took lessons in being rude. But now nobody talks to one another. It's all online. And as we say at the bottom, this is an outdated comparison. Two, due to technologically, technological advances, mergers, acquisitions, and the sheer volume of how many shares trade every day, the traditional differences have been erased, and the changes are just getting started. The folks, the 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 the, uh, the stock markets are changing at breakneck speed. Uh, as you read in the news, <laughs> as you watch on the news these days, here we are. So, slide sixteen. Historically, on the securities exchanges, all trading was conducted on the floor. The trading was conducted using a double auction system. You're used to seeing one seller with multiple buyers in an auction, right? A state auction, a farm auction. But no, 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 that's not how it worked. There were multiple sellers, multiple buyers, all calling out prices and quantities and how much they would buy and sell. It looked like mayhem from afar. But once you got down in the pits, you realized that they were all just trading amongst themselves. But Due to both technological and the sheer massive volume of shares traded, things have changed. Almost all of the trading is now conducted electronically. There's still some a little bit of, of trading done on the floor, but most of the time, you look see the people, they're just standing around looking at screens, and I think they just keep it there for the television. I think, I don't know, I haven't asked them, but, but uh, I don't. it doesn't seem to be much going on on the floors anymore. Some people might disagree with you, but maybe they know better. But from watching it, it doesn't look like much stuff is going on. 
So the granddaddy of them all was the New York Stock Exchange, the NYSC, the big board. Traditionally, this was responsible for over 90% of the volume of transactions on the exchanges. There's about 2,400 companies that come and go. About $15 trillion of market capitalization as of 2020 last year. It was established as a members-only entity in 1792, when Wall Street really was next to a wall. It was a partnership. The companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange must meet stringent requirements, and these were the largest and most prestigious companies traditionally. It's all changed. Companies can be delisted when they no longer uh, uh, are big companies anymore. For example, Kodak. Uh, Kodak was struggling. I mean, they developed the, 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 the they developed the digital camera, the technology that put them out of business because they used to sell film. And there were parts of Kodak that were still going on. They still are going on. But the company is now a shell of what it used to be. So the New York Stock Exchange said, sorry, you know, no more. You can't be on our exchange. You have to go someplace else because they weren't large enough. There were very big changes at the New York Stock Exchange over the last few decades. In 2005, they purchased an electronic exchange called the Archipelago. They purchased the Pacific Regional Exchange. Hmm. They became a publicly traded corporation in March of 2006. See, they used to be a partnership, a membership. The first woman member wasn't until 1966. The first minority member, I think, wasn't until 1991. And they merged with an electronic exchange in Europe called the Euronext. They phased out that face-to-face -face double auction trading in favor of, I should say, 99.99% of the time exclusively trading electronically. And in 2011, remember, in 2006, remember, they became a publicly traded corporation, which means you could buy and sell in shares of the New York Stock Exchange. Germany's stock market, the Bursa, I hope I said that right, tried to purchase the New York Stock Exchange, but they were blocked by the European regulators. And then in 2013, the New York Stock Exchange was acquired for $11 billion by a 13-year-old derivative trading firm from Atlanta. Georgia, the Intercontinental Exchange. In other words, a company that started in the year 2000 bought a company or a, uh, an entity, now it's a company, right, that started in the year 1792. And on their 200th birthday in 1992, if you had told the folks at the New York Stock Exchange, the next 20 years would see far more changes than in their first 200 years, they probably would have thought you quite insane, but you would have been right, because within 20 years, 21 years, they were no longer owned by the New York Stock Exchange. They're now owned by a, a company in Atlanta. Hmm. They used to have the floor brokers, the people running around with different colored jackets, and you looked like mayhem, but you know, once you were part of it, you understood what was going on. Brokers that would execute orders on behalf of the firm's customers, occasionally on behalf of the firm's own account. There were independent brokers that 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 ran around and did work for people as needed, called two dollar brokers because that's how much they charged. The four brokers were very worried that the NYSC's aggressive move to all electronic trading meant the end of their way of life. Well, it really wasn't the end. It was just a big change from face-to-face -face interaction to sitting in front of a computer screen all day. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> I'm sitting in front of a computer screen talking to you, but not talking to you because you're not there at this time. I'm going to then put this on various places where you will then download it and listen to it. Yes, face-to-face -face interaction. <laughs> and that's, see, you used to, in the face-to-face -face class, by the way, we we do a little uh, a game where we do a market simulation uh, and uh, try to play the game of, we show a little video, and, and I'm going to keep it up there from last year, from 
from uh, spring of 2020, but it, it's, a, it's a little hard to follow what's going on. But uh, they actually did pretty well. I was pretty impressed with them. It was complete and utter mayhem. And it had to end. Why? Because of computers. And the fact that they just couldn't trade billions of shares a day, hand face to hand, face to face, hand with hand gestures, saying, I'll buy, I'll sell, I'll do it. It just didn't work anymore. So the New York Stock Exchange now still has some people on the floors, brokers, but it's all uh, electronic. And then the New York Stock Exchange had what were called specialists. Now, again, these people have changed their, there's no longer what they're doing, what they used to do, but they're still in there. They're now called designated market makers or supplementary liquidity providers. And we'll see what a market maker is in a bit when we take a look at the, at the other big boy on the block, big girl on the block. But the specialists were stock exchange members. They, they were members of the exchange who specialized in making transactions in one or more stocks. You see, the job of the specialist was to manage the auction process. The specialist would buy or sell the stock from their own inventory to provide a continuous, fair, and orderly market. So think about it. All of a sudden, people stop buying for whatever reason. The prices plummet. The job of the specialist was to get in there and buy. Or for some odd reason, everyone's, buy everyone's buying and the prices keep skyrocketing. The job of the specialist was to get in there and sell to continue to provide a continuous, fair, and orderly market. But, but what's happening? The role of the specialist has essentially been squeezed out by technology and the tremendous volume of trading. They are now involved in only a tiny amount of trading every day. And as we said, they're not called the specialists anymore. They're called designated market makers. I'm going to see where that phrase comes from. From time to time, the specialists were either praised or maligned. It's suffice to say that the specialists were trying to make a profit just like everybody else. Now, while their goal may seem altruistic, they certainly did their best to make sure that when the market received benefits from their efforts, so did they. So in other words, they had a little bit of an inside job, inside a position. And so there were a few situations where specialists were doing some hanky-panky, and we won't discuss exactly what was going on, but they had some inside information that the other people didn't have. And But for the most part, that was the exception, not the rule. What they did worked. It kept the exchanges going, except for sometimes, like October 19th, 1987, when the market dropped 23% in one day. And so in the face-to-face -face class, we would show you a little film about what happened that day. Suffice to say, people believed that the world was going to end. Same thing that they believed back in 1929 and then in 2008 and 9. And yeah, it's capitalism, folks. It's a history of booms and busts. Okay, now, who was the little kid on the block? For decades... That was the, the American exchange, the Amex, the curb. Huh? The curb? And you'll still hear some people call it the curb. They started on the curb outside the New York Stock Exchange. That's why they called it the curb. <laughs> the, the American exchange started with a bunch of guys, mostly all guys. In fact, there's a link to a picture of them, what they're all wearing, their little hats that they wore, outside and trading they would look in the window and see what was going on in the New York Stock Exchange, and they would trade outside. Much, well, now, then they moved down the block to their own building. Uh, much smaller. They never got very large. 3% of the volume of all exchanges. And in the uh, early 90s, they decided to start concentrating on securities other than stocks. Remember the exchange-traded funds? Well, that's where they got their start. The exchange-traded funds got their start on the Amex. And when they were purchased by the NASDAQ, who's that? We'll come to the NASDAQ in a few bit. Relax. They were purchased by, by the NASDAQ in 1998. And I thought, well, that's the end of the Amex. Well, the, the NASDAQ kicked them out in 2004. <laughs> and then the New York Stock Exchange uh, uh, acquired them in 2008. 
and they moved down the street into the same building. And the first thing they did was change the name to the New York Stock Exchange Mickett. MKT, Mickett, MKT Market, I don't know, which I think was a really, really stupid name. And when it, and when I saw that, I, it, first of all, I didn't see it for a couple of years until after personally. I, I called my boss at the burger store and said, do you know the Amex is now called New York Stock Exchange Mickett or, or, or MKT or Market, whatever it is? And he went, uh, no. <laughs> And when this kind of stuff would happen before, you know, all the crazy stuff, this this would have been huge news. And yet nobody even knew what happened. Well, somebody at the New York, Exchange, New, York, New York Stock Exchange got a little smarter and has changed the name now to New York Stock Exchange American. But So it's still around, even though it's in the same building. Basically, you know, hasn't changed much. Slide number 22. Then there were the regional stock exchanges, which were modeled after the New York Stock Exchange in the Amex, Chicago, Philadelphia, Boston, Denver, Cincinnati. Pacific is the weirdie. The Pacific Exchange was actually two places, Los Angeles and San Francisco. That was the only one that was two different places. And many of the securities, mostly stocks, listed on the regional exchanges were also available in the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. Traditionally, the regional exchanges were often places where undesirable or unethical issues were sold. The Denver was famous for this. Lately, or should we say the last 20 years or so, they've tried to diversify and differentiate themselves from the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ just to survive. For example, the Philadelphia Exchange is famous for its uh, trading of uh, chip makers, uh, sil sil silicon companies. And they have not been immune to the rush to consolidate. The New York Stock Exchange bought this Pacific Exchange. The NASDAQ bought the Philadelphia Exchange. You see what's going on here? Mergers and acquisitions. Consolidation. Okay. There are also options for futures and, uh, I'm sorry, there are also exchanges for futures and options. And what are these things? Remember, all you need to know are, are they are derivatives that derive their value. But that made sense. These futures are dealing with commodities like corn and wheat and, and pork bellies and beef and cattle. And where better than Chicago, where most all the beef and, and wheat were, was going through the Midwest to Chicago then to be shipped around the world. So they had exchanges for them, too. And they still do. They still have the exchanges for them. But again, pretty much everything that's sold there is sold everywhere else because of competition consolidation. Now, let's take a look at the OTC, the over-the-counter market, which is a sort of anachronism, meaning the word, the phrase is really, we shouldn't, we should come up with a different name right now. And as we said, it was a widely scattered telecommunications network through which transactions of securities were made. There was no one single location. Uh, it was mostly all people in their offices in Minneapolis and Kansas City and Detroit that were just calling one another, making deals. But that's all over now, folks. They don't do that anymore. It's all electronic. And this was a quote-based system. You didn't have people screaming and hollering at one another at the double auction as we did on the exchanges because they weren't next to one another. There are three tiers. The NASDAQ, the National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quotation System. Look, folks, they don't even want you to know that that's where the name came from. They just call themselves the NASDAQ. And they don't want to be associated anymore with the OTC because the other two major players are the bulletin board and the markets group which used to be called the pink sheets and you wonder where the term pink sheet came from well that they published a newspaper that was on pink paper with 20,000 different companies and the and the uh, the, uh, the 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 how many shares traded Price and that it was that was how they communicated. You looked in the pink sheets. Hmm. Well, folks, these the bulletin board and the and the and the pink sheets, the market OTC markets group, 
they're trying to clean up their act. At least they say they are. But still, most of the companies that are there are companies that are either, and this is the very small number, really, really in trouble and trying to get their act together. Or they're just scams. Most all of them are just not real companies. They're just somebody's garage somewhere in Idaho or Iowa or one of those places that starts with the letter I. Uh, so stay away. The penny stocks live on these places. And these this is the wrong side of the tracks. The red light district, the bad side of town. Mm -hmm. And we'll take a look at some penny stock examples. Stay away. So now, let's take a look at the role of dealers in the OTCs. You see, in the in the in exchanges they were most all all brokers. They were acting on behalf of clients, whereas dealers are like the specialists. They make a market. That's why they're called market makers. They offer to buy or sell certain securities at stated prices. The dealers offer buy and sell quotes from their own inventories of stocks, whereas brokers simply serve as a go-between between buyers and sellers. They don't normally keep an inventory, although as brokerage firms got larger and larger, they started to keep their own inventories. And so you have to memorize these two phrases. I wish they didn't use it, ask and bid price. I don't like these names. I would have called the ask price the retail price because that's the price you and I have to pay. But when we go to sell our securities back to these people, we get the wholesale price, the bid price. So however you memorize them, it's up to you, but you have to memorize them. And I like to think of the ask price. If you have to ask for it, yeah, that's the higher one. When we go online and start looking at these things, you're going to see bid and ask. You're going to see that there's two different prices. And the difference is called the spread. The market makers, the dealers, make their money not on a commission, but on the spread. So the dealers, the market makers on the NASDAQ and the other OTC markets perform roughly the same role as the specialists on the New York Stock Exchange. That's why they changed the name of the specialists to designated market makers to sort of basically say, hey, you know, that's what we are. Make sense? Probably not, but you're going to see a, a presentation out there on the Casas de Cambio, Cambio the, the money exchange houses along the border with Tijuana and San Isidro and San Diego. And it's an, it's an excellent, excellent uh, way to think of that because it's exactly what's going on in the world of the uh, NASDAQ and the OTC markets and now the New York Stock Exchange because they all basically work in the same way. Unlike the brokers who charge a commission, slide 26, dealers make money from the spread of the bid and the ask prices, just as the Casas de Cambio and San Isidro make money on the difference between the prices in which they buy and sell pesos and dollars. That's the same thing going on with stocks. The dealer's markups or the dealer's markdowns when you buy, when you sell your shares are not reported to the customers, whereas the broker's commissions are reported. So how do you think the internet brokers make money on 5 or $7 or $0 now per trade? Hmm? How do you think they make money? Well, obviously, they're making money somehow. And this is that. This is how they do it. The dealer, the market maker, the specialist, they're not called specialists anymore, kick back some money back to the broker so that the broker doesn't go out of business very quickly because you can't work for free forever. It just doesn't work that way. So the NASDAQ, the NASD, which is now a defunct organization. You see, there used to be a group called the National Association of Securities Dealers. That was the non-governmental organization that used to be responsible for self-regulation of registered representative stockbrokers, brokerage firms. It was sponsored by the Securities and Exchange Commission, but it was a non-governmental organization. And in 1971, they created the NASDAQ, the National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quotation System, which they don't want you to know it even stands for that anymore. They want you to just know themselves as the NASDAQ. 
They provide now up-to-date bid and ask prices on approximately 3,300 stocks. You see, the NASDAQ used to be the arena for smaller companies that didn't want to be associated with the pink sheets or the bulletin boards to get started. And once they became large enough, they would then, <coughs> it was just expected, they were going to move to the big board, the New York Stock Exchange. But then something along, something happened in the 1980s or so, 1990s, when most many prestigious companies decided, no, we're very happy here on the NASDAQ. Thank you very much, New York Stock Exchange. No, we're very happy here. Some of you might have heard of some of these companies, like Apple and Microsoft and Intel. Yeah. <laughs> ah, can you imagine? There were two words said on the 23rd floor of the Wall Street building in the New York Stock Exchange. The first one was O, oh, and can you imagine the second one? Oh, my goodness. And now it's a two-horse race, where before the New York Stock Exchange was, you know, that was the place to be. Now you've got some serious competition. Mm -hmm. It's a three-tier system, although we don't have to remember this. I'm not going to ask you this on the exam. No one's going to ask you this. But it, they have three tiers. The, the creme de la creme, the biggest companies, which would easily qualify the New York Stock Exchange. In fact, companies like Google, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft are all larger than anything on the New York Stock Exchange. Then the global market and then the, the small cap market, which is now called the capital market. In the 1990s, they began positioning themselves via television commercials, which I think most people didn't understand, but they were positioning themselves, themselves as the securities market of the future. And as you know, New York Stock Exchange is the securities market of the past. A <laughs> little bit of jab there. As it became apparent that the traditional face to face double auction model was not adequate to keep up with the massive increase of trading. The NASDAQ's market capitalization around 2020 or so is 17 trillion. So it's still smaller than the New York Stock Exchange, but it has some of the largest, it has the largest companies in the world, as we mentioned with Apple, Amazon, the, Tesla and, and uh, Microsoft and uh, Google. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the, it's a two-horse race, folks. Now, along the same lines as the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ were these alter alternative trading systems, which were using new technologies from the 1980s and 1990s to perform over-the-counter transactions made in securities that were listed on the New York Stock Exchange, the Amex, the the NASDAQ, but you had to be an institutional investor who traded large blocks of securities. So in other words, you were a mutual fund and you weren't going to buy 100 shares of uh, Starbucks. You are going to buy 5,000 shares or 50,000 shares or sell 50,000 shares. So you wanted to deal with people who were in the same situation where they they weren't going to buy 100 of your, 100 your shares and now there's 200 shares, I'll buy 300. No, uh, you're going to, he's going to buy your 50,000 shares. And so these people were a, a system still facilitated by a dealer that would allow large blocks of securities. You see? So, so they were a small clientele, but many, many shares. And one of the biggest examples of that was the inner part market inner market, which was purchased by the NASDAQ. <laughs> you see? Competition! Oh my goodness, look at what they're doing. We'll buy you. And then the fourth market, which were transactions made directly between large institutional buyers and sellers, but they got rid of the dealer, and they bypassed the dealer and got rid of the middleman and went right to one another right to one another, yeah, right to the, allowed the like, kind of like eBay, allowed, or Craigslist, <laughs> allowed the investors to automatically match, buy, and sell orders that customers placed electronically. And so one of the examples of this was the Archipelago, which is now owned by the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> You see, they're not going to, they're, they're, they, they, the competition is very fierce. And then there's another group called BATS. What a great name. Better Alternative Trading System. They operate out of a 
strip mall in Kansas City. Take that, Manhattan. <laughs> With the advent of the internet, the third and the fourth markets successfully started to court retail investors. And of course, this got the attention of the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. So you see what's happening, folks? Yeah, it's changing at breakneck speed. So we've gone through them. We've gone through the major markets here in the States. There are others outside the United States. And we see that the urge to merge and the, uh, the uh, uh, technology is driving competition and innovation at a breakneck speed. But you come back to the same old argument that people have made for decades, for our, maybe close to a few hundred years now. Isn't the stock market all just one big malignant casino? Well, you know, you're going to get this from somebody in your family or a friend or, fa or a coworker or whatever because they're going to realize that you, you know, are involved in the stock market and you're taking business 123. And you know what? You have to you have to be truthful, folks, because the answer to this question is yes and no. <laughs> huh? How can it be yes and no? Well, again, it depends on you. It depends on how you use this system. Yes, it is one big malignant casino for many individuals who see the market as just one big crapshoot. For them, the way to riches is to buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell. We call them speculators, traders, T-R-A-D-E-R-S. It is very difficult, folks. You're up against the best in the business. And neophytes become very upset when the market turns against them and usually don't last more than a few months at the most. And then the answer to the question is no. No, it is not a big malignant casino for many others who look at the capital markets as a way to participate in the growth and prosperity now of the global economy. We call them investors. With a long-term orientation, investors are usually very well rewarded. If we don't panic, if we don't chase after the next big thing, if we look at these as companies, as businesses for which we want to participate. And we will, again, this gives us a, yet another uh, opportunity to, to uh, quote Mr. Benjamin Graham, an investment operation is one which, upon thorough analysis, promises safety of principle and an adequate return. Operations not meeting these requirements are speculative, which is another word for gambling. So uh, it's very interesting. Just today, what is this, the, the 15th of February? Uh, I saw, I haven't read the article, but there the, there's a woman who runs the New York Stock Exchange. She's just the president. She's, she's not really in charge. The people down in Atlanta are in charge. But she said, no, no, no. The stock market is not one big casino. Well, she's wrong. <laughs> for some people, it is a big casino. And for other people, which those people are going to be you. You're going to be part of them. You're going to be investors, not speculators. It is not a big casino. Oh, yeah, Piano. Oh, yeah. What about Enron? Some of you don't even know who Enron was, was it? This was what? Almost 20, well, was almost 20 years ago. Um, fraud and accounting, trickery and gimmicks have always been with us. They're always going to be with us because that's where the money is. You've heard that saying? <laughs> what? So, he didn't actually say it, and a reporter just made it up. But they supposedly a reporter asked a famous. Bank robber, Willie Sutton, Willie Sutton. Why do you rob banks, Mr. Sutton? Because that's where the money is. He didn't actually say it. <laughs> but he, he, it was a great saying anyway. And this is where the money is, right? <laughs> so they're always going to be with us. But normally, but not always, these firms are regulated to the OTC, the bulletin board, the pink sheets. But for every one Enron or WorldCom, or Global Crossing, or Tyco, there are hundreds, no, thousands of companies that continue to do business with integrity and honestly, well, usually, 
Look, in 1973, there was a company called Equity Funding, an insurance company, folks. Insurance companies, that's a license to make money. It's like a bank. When you grow up, you want to be a bank. And if not, you want to be a life insurance company. What were they doing? They were walking into a room and just making up policies. They're just filling out policies with phony people. How long do you think that was going to last? It was good while it lasted, but then, of course, yeah. In 1986, it was Ivan Boski and Vagabond Inns. Who are they? Hey, by, by the way, they're based here in San Diego. Look around. You'll see a Vagabond Inn every once in a while. And this gentleman, Ivan Boski, and his counterpart, Michael Milken, were the people that they modeled the first Wall Street movie after. They were basically scamming. <laughs> now, you got luck. if you're interested in... If you want to get involved in what kind of stuff they were doing or learn about how uh, what they were doing, please look them up. In 2002, we had Enron, Global Crossing, Tyco, WorldCom. In 2008, it was Fannie, Freddie, Lehman Brothers, City, Wamu, Wachovia, AIG, when the financial crisis hit, the global financial crisis. And don't forget Bernie Madoff. He had a Ponzi scheme going for 15 years. Unheard of. Usually Ponzi schemes don't last very long at all and 10 or 20 years from now maybe two years from now during the next big bull market craze somebody else is going to take their place which is why we do our research we look at real companies making real products making real money and look at their competitors and the market as a whole and that's what we're going to learn how to do folks and there's no guarantees but if you choose companies that have their roots deep in the economy and don't try to you know, get rich really quickly, and the world doesn't end. I can't guarantee it, but I really do believe you'll do very well. And we'll see. So, to recap, slide 33. The securities markets exist to allow investors a safe, cost-effective method to participate in the success of the global economy. And even with all the underhanded shenanigans, trucos, travesuras, they have performed very well. They are changing at breakneck speed. And the change is accelerating. Whether or not we ever have one or more global 24-hour trading markets remains to be seen. And lately, I haven't heard this. For about 10 years ago, you were hearing lots of people saying, we're going to have a 24-hour trading market. It just doesn't seem to be happening which is fine with me. There's no reason at 2 a.m. in the morning you need to wake up and sell, and sell your 100 shares of McDonald's. You just don't need to do it, folks. But it is exciting and for some people scary to watch, especially for those of us who have a stake in the outcome. So go back over, make sure you know the major marketplaces, the New York Stock Exchange, the Amex, the NASDAQ, the pink sheets and the bulletin boards. And... We're not going to ask you very detailed questions about these, but you need to be able to identify these um, markets. Cool. Okay. All right. So study, study, study. Bring honor and glory to Southwestern College. We are so proud of you. We are so grateful and honored that you're here with us. And let's continue learning about exciting, sexy, very risky stocks.